pleased to welcome uh, Andrew Gordon Wilson uh, to Second Mind. Uh, he is a, a, a assistant professor at uh, NYU. Before that, uh, he was uh, assistant professor at Cornell University. And uh, before that, he was a, a research fellow at uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon University. And even before that, he was actually a PG student here in Cambridge, uh, working with uh, Zubin Gahabrani. And uh, from that period, I remember some uh, nice work uh, on uh, learning kernels. Uh, but personally, most of all, I know him for a paper that probably most of you here didn't read. <laughs> it was using uh, Gaussian process and ker uh, kernels to understand human learning, which is a topic close to my heart as well. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm sure that uh, a lot of people here knows uh, quite a few of his uh, uh, papers. He had, uh, I think, uh, a nice impact in the uh, Gaussian process community. Uh, but recently I have seen also uh, some extensions to quite a few other uh, directions. Uh, I've seen uh, some really nice work on uh, uh, landscape of objective functions in deep learning. Uh, there are some nice contributions there. Um, well, I'm excited to hear what uh, what this talk is going to be about. Um, please take the floor. Thank you. Well, it's really nice to be here. Um, just to check, are we recording it? I didn't get a this meeting is being recorded thing on. Uh, yes, yeah. it is being recorded. Um, okay. Well, it says... <laughs> <laughs> on the top of my screen. Oh, oh, I see in the top left. No, I just didn't get the thing. Okay, great. Well, it's it's awesome to be here. Uh, I've known about Second Mind and Prowler um, before that for, for quite a while. I think it was just sort of starting up around the time I was leaving Cambridge. So I, I finished my PhD near the end of 2013, early 2014, uh, and then moved to C CMU. And uh, in my, my PhD, I was uh, uh, very excited about trying to make Gaussian processes practical, and this seemed to involve addressing two questions primarily, kernel selection and scalability. And I felt in many ways like they went hand in hand, because if you had a lot of data, then you had a greater opportunity to learn an interesting kernel, which would provide a good representation for problems like extrapolation. And this also led to some other interesting tangents that were briefly mentioned, like the human kernel paper, where um, in trying to do extrapolation with Gaussian processes, it became clear that state-of-the-art algorithms were actually really bad at a lot of extrapolation problems that would be trivial for people. And you know, loving Gaussian processes so much, it's natural to think that every intelligent system is in some sense a, a kernel machine. And in order to solve this problem well, then perhaps we could derive some inspiration by finding out what it is that what kernel it is that people are using in order to extrapolate on these problems. So we did some of these psychological experiments and um, on Mechanical Turk and asked people to draw various extrapolations. And the assumption was that these were um, different posterior samples from a shared generative model. And this actually provides a lot of statistical strength for trying to learn, um, learn a kernel function. And then once we have that kernel function, we could provide human-like extrapolations on various problems, but also gain psychological insights into how people perceive similarities between different points, which in some cases is quite different than how uh, standard covariance functions treat similar points as being uh, related or not. Okay, so uh, this talk is really about anything um, we want and I encourage uh, you to ask lots of questions and for it to be really interactive and it can sort of develop organically. Um, in principle, I, I'd like to talk a lot about um, Bayesian deep learning, partly because I think this is an area which is um, very quickly changing and it's exciting for that reason. There's a lot of opportunity to make interesting contributions. It's becoming very practical, but also partly because it exposes, I think, a lot of foundational questions about Bayesian inference, how we should be doing approximate inference, how we should be thinking about prior specification, etc. Because we're in a somewhat new regime working with um, models with um, that are still parametric but have many 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 parameters and a very complicated loss surface etc we often um, face somewhat distinct challenges that i think also encourage us to revisit concepts like approximate inference even in other settings um, sometimes something needs to fail very badly for us to be aware that there is a problem at all 
And once we see that there might be a problem, we can apply the solution to a variety of different contexts, even if the problem isn't as significant in those other areas. Okay, so with that, um, I'll just start with uh, the equation that we're often trying to compute when we're making predictions using a Bayesian approach in a supervised setting. So I'll just put a little title slide, I guess. Bayesian model construction. So we have some targets, why? So these could be like regression outputs, they could be class labels. They're indexed typically by some inputs, X. I'm just writing X star to be a test point. So any X where we want to make predictions. Um, and uh, our data set, D. And using the sum and product rules of probability, that's going to be equal to the conditional distribution of Y star given our parameters and X star times the posterior over our parameters given the data and we're integrating with respect to the parameters. So fundamentally what this is saying is rather than use a single setting of the parameters, use all possible settings of the parameters and weight them by their posterior probabilities. So we could view um, the classical approach, regularized maximum likelihood as a special case of this procedure where um, we just say, we're going to use an approximate posterior, which is a point mass centered around the regularized maximum likelihood solution or the map estimate of the parameters. So that's what we obtain. Um, w map is just equal to the arg max over W of P of W given D. Okay. So from this perspective, um, it seems that even if we can't create a good approximation to the posterior, or we can't perfectly estimate this integral, we can probably do a lot better than a classical approach by using something other than a point mass. Even if the posterior, for instance, is highly non-Gaussian, um, a Gaussian distribution might be a better approximation than a point mass. And so there are things we can do that aren't a perfect answer to this integral that are still in many cases preferable to the classical approach. Now, if we're working with a big modern neural network, which I'll call f of xw, then we'll be able to represent quite a variety of different solutions to a given problem corresponding to different settings of the parameters w. For example, um, if we are doing image classification and we specify our architecture or ResNet or whatever we, we want it to be, and then we train it with SGD, and then we retrain with a different initialization, and then we retrain again with another different initialization, we'll find a bunch of different functions which all seem to provide um, compelling but complementary explanations of the data such that if we average together their predictions at any test point will often perform a lot better and also have better calibrated uncertainty than we would get if we were to just use a single model. So that procedure actually is called deep ensembles. So let's write that down. So deep ensembles, uh, step one, retrain, f x w with sgd typically it doesn't really have to be um, many times starting from different initializations to find w1 up to wj and then step two, form g of x equals one over j f of x w1 up to wj. Okay, so the fact that this works really well in many cases indicates that there's 
probably a lot to gain by doing something like this integral, a Bayesian model average versus just using a single solution. Um, we're going to be able to capture many complementary explanations of the data. And in a sense, this is just an artifact of trying to represent epistemic uncertainty, which is model uncertainty over which setting of parameters is the, the right setting of parameters given a particular problem. Often, um, given the number of parameters a modern neural network has and the number of data points that we're considering, there are just many different complementary explanations of the data and it would be hard to strongly prefer one over the other a priori. So what this means in short is that by trying to estimate this integral in deep learning, we'll have an especially different answer compared to class classical methods relative maybe to other model classes where the posterior, for instance, might be more concentrated. It might actually look a bit more like a point mass or where there might not be a lot of functional variability in the conditional predictive distribution, y given w, for the different settings of w where the posterior has mass. So in this sense, we're more motivated to be Bayesian in deep learning than arguably in, in any other standard context in machine learning. Um, the challenge is how do we come up with a good estimate of this integral? Well, I would argue that deep ensembles actually um, provide a very good heuristic for trying to estimate this, this integral. Um, so this is actually, um, I don't think it should be, but it seems to be kind of a control, controversial point. You know, are deep ensembles Bayesian or not? And I think this isn't just a question of semantics. It's actually um, very important to try to have uh, a clear understanding of whether or in what ways deep ensembles are or are not Bayesian, because we can use that understanding to actually build very practically effective approaches. And also to sort of differentiate, for example, between different approaches to ensembling. So ensembling is actually a fairly general concept. And I think there are notions about it that people kind of misapply in some cases when we're just looking at a special case of ensembling, for instance. Okay. So are deep ensembles Bayesian? Well, the, the Bayesian ideal is to try to compute this predictive distribution. And standard conventional Bayesian approaches will typically try to do this by either, um, say we'll say standard approaches, this will be equation one. Can you just interrupt uh, with yeah, a of course. quick question? Yeah. Um, what would be your relation to bootstrapping? I've seen some uh, uh, recent uh, work that uh, bootstrapping for some reason doesn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. You create an ensemble with bootstraps rather than uh, what you said with the different initializations. Yeah, so that would be a different procedure. We do things like subsample data and so on. And I've heard the same thing, that it doesn't tend to work that well. I haven't explored it much myself, so I, I'm kind of worried about being confident about whether it works or not. But um, I see it done a little bit sometimes in model-based reinforcement learning, um, which may be where you were considering it, actually. I, I know this is an interest of Prowler's um, and, and Second Minds now. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's a different procedure. And I don't immediately have intuitions about why that is not um, necessarily that practically effective, or at least it doesn't seem to be that widely applied in practice. Um, perhaps it's because it's like, it involves very, I mean, this is just sort of me um, rationalizing why it might not be popular, but like um, arguably it could be because it involves a bunch of design decisions that standard deep ensembles don't. It's sort of a deep ensembles, as I presented them, are, are a very easy procedure to apply and they tend to achieve, I would assume, better performance because you're making full use of the data and there's a lot of variety still in the posterior distribution or the loss that we're using to train these models. Um, and so like variety of solutions. And so uh, my guess uh, as to potentially why bootstrapping isn't more common is deep ensembles is easier. And in this context probably works better for the reason that we can make full use of the data and still explore quite a rich variety of models. But I guess in the, when you have a lots of data, I would expect that it makes such a big difference uh, bootstrapping, but okay. Um, I mean, it depends how many times you want to bootstrap, et cetera, as well. And this is a point that I'm uh, going to get to actually in the context of deep ensembles. Okay, so we can, we can potentially come back to that. So there are two standard approaches, um, I would argue, to computing equation one. 
The first would be MCMC, where we obtain approximate samples samples from p w given d and then compute um, p of y star given x star d through a simple Monte Carlo average. And WJ are sampled, which we, we could sort of write them as sampled from some sort of approximation to the posterior in a sense and asymptotically um, we'll be sampling from the exact posterior. The other approach or other family of approaches would be deterministic approximations. Let's create a new whiteboard where we say, let's propose some kind of distribution Q, Q of W given, um, we'll say parameters theta and um, find theta to minimize the distance d between q w given theta and p of w given d. And q is chosen for convenience because p is hard to work with. So often we'll choose q for instance to be a Gaussian distribution, a variational method would choose the distance in this case to be the KL divergence between q and p. Uh, which isn't really a proper distance metric. Uh, it's not symmetric. So if we tried to minimize KLPQ, for instance, we would get a different answer for Q. Um, but uh, if, for instance, our distance metric is the KL divergence and Q is able to represent um, the exact posterior corresponding to, to some of its parameters theta, then in principle, if we're doing a good job of optimization, then we could find those parameters. Um, but probably that's not the case because we're choosing Q to be convenient. And if we could exactly represent the posterior, then maybe why not just work with the posterior? Okay, so that's the second approach. Now, um, in the MCMC case, um, in, especially if we're working with um, big modern neural nets, we're not typically going to be able to take that many samples. And we're also going to have a lot of trouble effectively exploring the posterior distribution. So this posterior distribution, PW given D, for um, you know, a large modern neural, neural net is highly multimodal, multimodal, high dimensional, you know, maybe at least 10 million dimensional, often more. Um, uh, and um, uh, the function f of x w will be expensive to query for different parameter settings. So if we want to make a prediction using our model average and um, we have taken say J samples from an approximate posterior, that means we have to do J forward passes through our neural network. And that will actually be very expensive at test time. And so is expensive or forward passes, we'll say forward passes forward passes through F, X, W are expensive. So number of samples that we take are going to have to be fairly constrained. J typically, typically small. So about 10, I would say would be standard. All right, so that's MCMC. Um, for the deterministic approximations, well, we know um, for many of these reasons that um, the standard choices that we make for convenience, like a Gaussian approximate posterior, while they might be better than a point mass, are still going to be quite poor approximations 
to the actual posterior distribution. They're not going to capture a lot of solutions that we would want to capture in forming a good Bayesian model average, a good estimate of this integral. So let's kind of go back to the integral we're trying to solve. Y star given X star D equals this integral of P of Y star given W X star times P of W given D DW. And think, just forgetting everything that we know about approximate inference and instead thinking about this like a math problem, like an integration problem under constraints, like we're only allowed to query our model at 10 different locations, for instance, in parameter space. Um, how would we come up with a good approximation to this integral? Well, the things that we would probably want to select for would be um, a reasonable amount of functional variability. So we would want to have, um, so desiderata would be, we want the conditional varies for different WJ. And we would want um, the different WJ to represent typical points in PW given D. So that is points that um, represent regions where there's a lot of posterior mass. Uh, so those would be kind of at a high level. The properties we would want in an estimator for this integral, especially if we're very constrained in being able to only take a very small number of points W. Now, we can see from this perspective that deep ensembles is actually a pretty good heuristic for trying to achieve these desiderata. Um, by retraining our neural net with different random initializations, we're finding different modes in the posterior. And uh, so these will be low loss solutions. They'll also, through the properties of SGD, be fairly typical points. And they also provide very complementary solutions, much more so than if you're sampling within a single mode. So if our posterior looks a bit like this, and we have this approximation to one of these modes just in the dashed curve here, and we take a bunch of different samples, even if we take a million samples under that curve, it might not be as valuable in estimating this, this integral as just taking one sample from this mode and one sample from this mode. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of a nice property of these, these, these things. And it, indeed, it does seem that there's a lot of functional variability and that's trivial to verify empirically. Like if we have say a variational Gaussian approximate posterior and we take loads of samples, we can see how the predictions are varying. And then we can try retraining our model a couple times and compare that diversity. We can see the latter is often a lot more, a lot more diverse. And so in terms of trying to estimate the predictive distribution, which I think is really the only thing that matters, the Bayesian model average that we're using to make computations, um, deep ensembles from this perspective is arguably more Bayesian than a lot of approaches that we conventionally consider to be Bayesian approaches to this problem. So in a sense, we're not really trying to get good posterior samples or even a high fidelity representation of the posterior when we're doing approximate inference, that's all just a proxy for trying to compute uh, an accurate um, Bayesian model average. And so um, interestingly, I mean, there have been papers written like a few years ago by Google comparing deep ensembles to approaches like Bayes by backprop, which are uh, variational approximations to the parameters in the neural net. And they showed that the deep ensembles seem to outperform the Bayesian approaches on a, a number of different tasks. And uh, the sort of inferred conclusion or implicit conclusion was that maybe Bayesian deep learning is kind of a failed enterprise and we should just be doing ensembling. And I think this is actually very dangerous because the model that they were saying was non-Bayesian in this case was actually more Bayesian in a very meaningful sense than um, the, the Bayesian competitor. So if anything, the, the answer I think that we would derive from that result is we ought to be more Bayesian. But no. yeah, isn't that just kind of orthogonal points? Like, I mean, you could do variational inference and just initialize for different Q distributions and optimize those like five or 10 times and then use that as like a mixture. You could do MCMC with 
10 chains and just take the last sam ch uh, sample from each chain instead of 10 samples from the same chain and then you'd explore different modes in the same way, no? I, I agree, and you should probably try to do that, and that would be a way to derive inspiration from deep ensembles. What I'm referring to here is the very variational inference that was used in that paper and which is often used in practice where we just have a Gaussian approximate posterior. So the criticism here isn't of variational inference specifically, it's about how we perceive whether or not a procedure is, is Bayesian. And in many cases, I think it's very reasonable to consider deep ensembles to be providing a better approximation to the predictive distribution we want to compute than many approaches that are uncontroversially considered to be Bayesian approaches, such as variational inference with a Gaussian approximate posterior. But indeed, I think um, one thing one might derive from this would be to instead try to run the variational approximation many times with different initializations and maybe have a richer approximation of the posterior than a bunch of different point masses at uh, different modes. So, I'm, still, I'm still trying to see, to see that deep ensembles could be viewed as more Bayesian than Bayes by backprop, because Bayes by backprop has all the flaws, but at least it's explicitly trying to uh, address uh, and use Bayes theorem. And, and uh, here you're kind of implicitly relying on a lot of things working out in your favor, which may well not work out in your favor. Like if the network overfits uh, and you get a big spike in the likelihood that in a very narrow region of parameter space, it's going to spectacularly fail um, because you're not accounting for, for the, the nature of the problem. Oh, but um, that could happen with like uh, all sorts of Bayesian, like, you know, standard approximate inference procedures too. Like we can see something like the Laplace approximation, right? Which is a yeah. canonical approach to approximate Bayesian inference. Um, yeah. It's very mode seeking and its curvature is entirely defined locally. Um, and so you could have the same issue there where, um, you know, you would have a very um, compact representation even of a mode. And the KL divergence is biased towards having a pretty compact representation. It really wants to discourage the approximate posterior from having mass where the true posterior doesn't. And so you can end up with these very compact representations. And in the case of um, the loss surfaces or the posteriors for Bayesian neural nets, we know they're kind of super multimodal and we know that SGD is able to find relatively flat solutions and things like this. And so um, I would say that the way that many of these standard approximate inference procedures are deployed um, seriously violate what we already know about the problem. And so they, they don't provide a very compelling Bayesian approach. I would agree that the deep ensemble approach is kind of heuristic but intuitively, um, because it, it has these properties, it ought to be providing a better approximation to the, the predictive distribution than, than some of these alternatives. But what I think, my fear of, of, uh, my fear of moving away from that, uh, the more explicitly basing cases that we're losing something very important, which is the priors we place on the hyperparameters. And there's no, in, there's no explicit case of the priors in, 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 these, in deep ensembles, right? So, uh, and if we lose that, I think that's a huge part of what's wrong with Bayes by backprop and what can be improved in the future. Right. So um, uh, in terms of priors, I suppose those still would come in if we were doing regularization or weight decay or something like that. It would be probably a similar prior to what we would be using if we were doing Bayes by backprop, just the sort of standard Gaussian prior on, on parameters. So we would still benefit from that in some way, although I would contend that in Bayesian deep learning right now, the model average itself is more significant in many cases than the precise details of the, the prior over parameters. Um, and uh, that's actually kind of the next thing that I'll, I'll kind of explore in this, this presentation. Um, uh, I mean, I, I agree that, you know, deep ensembles are not perfect and I um, wouldn't want to stop there, but I think they are a big improvement over um, a lot of the standard lines of attack in this context. And the reasons are that they provide a, a very good heuristic for finding functional variability and typical points in the posterior, relatively flat regions of the loss surface, um, which therefore would, would have a lot of volume in this integral um, uh, uh, that um, you know, tend to provide pretty good, good, good sort of um, generalization. Um, so the, the next thing that you could do, actually I won't quite go to the next thing, but I mean, I'll, I'll now sort of argue against this a little bit. So I think that it's starting to be accepted that you know, it could be the case that, that the, the predictive distribution is, is approximated given a finite amount of computation better using these kinds of deep ensemble heuristics than by 
standard lines of attack. Um, and then indeed, suppose we could even get exact samples from the posterior, which we surely cannot, but let's suppose we could. And we were told you can only use 10 samples. You probably wouldn't even want exact posterior samples, right? Like you, you could be very unlucky. You could get a lot of redundancy in those samples. And so like, I think we're very far away from getting exact posterior samples, but even if we could, even if we could do that really well, I don't think we would want them if we were told you could only use 10 samples to try to come up with a good approximation to this predictive distribution. And so we, we always have to condition on <laughs> the, the reality of the situation that we're, that we're sort of faced with. And in this case, it's severe computational constraints. So what's the best that we can possibly do under these constraints, not what's the best we can do asymptotically. And that actually brings me to the next point. So I think, you know, one thing I've heard is, oh, well, deep ensembles aren't really Bayesian because, um, you know, if you keep retraining, your neural network a bunch of times, you'll just be finding different modes in the posterior. You'll, you'll never converge to like uh, an exact approximation or exact representation of this integral. Um, well, of course that's true, um, but also that's, that's true of virtually every deterministic approximation um, like, like the Laplace approximation or, um, or uh, variational methods. Um, uh, and these are you know, uncontroversially kind of accepted to be Bayesian procedures. So it's kind of interesting when there's sort of a double standard. There are reasons being used to explain why deep ensembles aren't Bayesian that would equally apply to other procedures that we just um, uncritically accept as like canonical approaches to approximate Bayesian inference. Um, and I would say even with MCMC, even though you get the asymptotic guarantees, we don't live in an asymptotic world. And given you know, any realistic number of samples, we're nowhere near realizing those guarantees. So it's kind of unclear even how that really matters practice. And um, you know, in practice is really the only thing that, that matters when we're doing experiments and we're trying to compare between different approaches. So um, any, any thoughts about that? I'd, I'd be happy for you know, questions on that as well, because it does seem to be a common counter argument right now that sort of, if we retrain the deep ensemble a, a load of times, we're not gonna get an exact representation of the posterior. For me, the the deep ensembles are Bayesian, for me, is not controversial at all. I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? So you have a prior on the, on the learning process or the learning parameters, so maybe on the step size or even in the regularization parameter or based on your experience of training this class of models, you know that the network is uh, rich enough to represent, so you just trying multiple times with these ideas and then you average them. Right. For me, at least this makes much more sense than putting a prior on the weights of the layers or something like that. Mm. Well, well, can I give a, maybe a slightly uh, orthogonal view to that is that my main concern is that say, let's say you have two modes of equal mass and one of them has a very large catchment area where you can start from and you will end up in that area. And one mm -hmm. has a very small catchment area, but the posterior mass is the same. Well, then the deep ensemble, you'll end up uh, 19, um, a million times out of a million and one, you'll end up in, in the mode with a large catchment area. So there are, I mean, so what I mean is that's not, is clearly not doing that integral in the, in those cases. What we're doing is where the reason it works well empirically is because clearly there are many surfaces where it does, well, and that approximation does work well. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, I, I'm a little hesitant to, to claim that, you know, we're, we're performing that integral. But as you say, there are known to be good conditions under where that's going to hold. That's no, a great that's observation. Probably, Go ahead. Yeah. But, no, I still think that's probably true of like MCMC and uh, BI as well. You'll probably end up finding the bigger one. Um, but yeah, maybe you are going to talk about that anyways. But I, I'm wondering, like, to what extent does it even make sense to put like priors on, uh, on the weights, right? Like, what does that even mean to have a prior mm -hmm. on the weights of a Mm -hmm. Bayesian neural network. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, so uh, just a quick comment about this this observation. Like, let's suppose there, the basins of attraction have different volumes, etc. Um, it might not be a bad thing if we mostly end up in this one because it would occupy more volume in this integral, um, and so we would want to weight it more strongly. But this would lead to another question: probably, does it make sense to have an equally weighted deep ensemble if we're finding, you know, for example, different points here? Like this point probably shouldn't be weighted as much as this point. Um, even if it has slightly lower posterior density um, because there's a lot more posterior mass in that region and we're trying to approximate this integral using a finite number of points. And I would say, well, yes, probably in that case, the weighting should be related to kind of the, the volume in a neighborhood 
of, of the point. However, it happens to be the case if we just retrain our neural net a bunch of times with the same optimization procedure, SGD, that's using the same learning rate schedule and stuff like that, that the, the local properties of each solution geometrically will be fairly similar. And so equal weighting is actually not, 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 not really far away from what we would want to do anyway. And uh, I've looked fairly closely into other sorts of weighting procedures and they don't really help that much practically. And I think it's because the properties of the modes that we find through independent SGD retraining tend to be fairly similar, even if the solutions on a test sample are actually fairly different. Okay, so the, I guess, you know, one, one quick thought also, also following up on marginalization is, well, you know, a, an easy thing we could do actually is, is basically just been suggested. So rather than like, if we have our posterior, which looks a bit like this, it really doesn't, but <laughs> uh, let's say we have a bunch of different modes. Um, and uh, 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 this is sort of our weights and this is our conceptualization of our weights and this is our posterior. Rather than just sort of having a bunch of point masses here, we might actually want to just have a mixture of Gaussians or something like this. And then we try to also, you know, we capture the different modes, but we also marginalize within the different basins of attraction. And so we proposed a simple way of doing that um, in this paper, Bayesian Deep Learning in a Probabilistic Perspective of Generalization called Multiswag. Uh, really nothing fancy at all. There's a swag algorithm that we had proposed in another paper and um, it basically recycles geometric information that you get through standard SGD training essentially to create an approximate Gaussian posterior and then it just runs that procedure, you know, independently a bunch of times to get a mixture of Gaussians and, um, you know, we compared this to deep ensembles and it tends to work um, better in, especially in instances where there's a lot of data corruption or you don't have that many independently sort of mod retrained models. So if you have maybe two or three modes um, rather than 10, uh, or um, your data is kind of very corrupted, then we do tend to benefit still from, you know, marginalizing within the basins rather than just representing each basin with a single point. And that of course is something you could also do with variational methods or other standard approximate inference procedures. Um, we chose SWAG because it's just very convenient. You basically just do SGD training and you've got an approximate Gaussian posterior, which tends to also be a bit better than, um, you know, the Laplace approximation and some of the variational approximations, partly because of the details of that procedure. So we kind of modify the learning rate schedule of SGD such that we sort of decay to a relatively large learning rate and then SGD is kind of bouncing around in this basin of attraction, but it's still a fairly global approximation within that basin because of the details of the learning rate schedule. And so it won't get trapped in kind of little spurious local optima in that region like Laplace can. So it, it tends to provide a somewhat more kind of global representation of each basin. And that does help uh, a bit in practice. Okay, so that's SWAG and, you know, I encourage you to, to check it out. I mean, it's related to an, an earlier procedure we had called SWA, um, which is a, a simple modification of uh, SGD and Atom and, and virtually any kind of like stochastic optimization procedure um, where you modify the learning rate schedule and then you take an equal average, very important that it's an equal average and not an exponential moving average of the different iterates. And this will tend to find you a much more centered solution in a flat region of the loss surface. And this will lead to, to better generalization without any additional computational expense. And that's, that's implemented natively in PyTorch, probably in TensorFlow as well. Although um, we did the PyTorch implementation and um, I, I think it probably works a bit better than the TensorFlow implementation, but maybe that's maybe not anymore. Okay, so the next question, priors in Bayesian deep learning. So we have our function f of xw, which is a neural net. So this is formed by, you know, a convolutional net or just, you know, having multiple uh, linear transformations of a bunch of units and, um, and then passing them through a nonlinearity for multiple layers, et cetera. And um, we want to um, choose some kind of prior uh, over PW. So want to specify PW. So this is indeed a hard question to do carefully. I would argue that it's always a hard thing to do carefully, regardless of the, the model class. Um, GPs are perhaps a, a somewhat of a special exception in the sense that we're able to think directly in function space. And so it's a little bit easier to have intuitions about, um, about 
what we're saying about the prior, like how, how the prior views similarity between points and things like this. Um, but I mean, that's unusual. I would say that the GPs are, are kind of the only really prominent example of being able to naturally specify function space priors. Um, now, how do we specify this prior PW? So there are different lines of attack. I mean, the standard approach is just to say PW equals N zero alpha squared I. So just a, a sort of a, a standard Gaussian prior, and then it's got some sort of variance scale alpha squared. And uh, then we use this prior to form our posterior from our likelihood, which makes use of f of x w. And then we, you know, sample from this posterior, or do deep ensembles or whatever it might be um, to form our Bayesian model average. Now, um, from working with Gaussian processes, we know that the prior that really matters is the prior in function space. It's not the prim prior in parameter space in isolation. Um, so by specifying some kind of prior P of W, we induce a prior over P of F of X, a prior over functions. Now, the properties of this prior over functions is going to be strongly controlled by the architecture itself. So when we think about what kinds of properties we want in function space, especially if we're doing things like image classification, we would probably think about things like translation invariance. Like if we, if we translate an image, we want the class label to be unchanged. We would want to capture properties like local similarity of pixels and maybe dissimilarity of kind of distant regions and things like this. So, if I was thinking about how to construct a really, really good prior for Bayesian deep learning, I would say that 99% of my mental energy would be devoted to architecture design. Because what I encode in the architecture will mostly be what affects this distribution over functions. Now, there will be a few things that are controlled by the distribution over parameters. Uh, so, this Gaussian distribution is what's most often used in practice. And um, at least in the last year or two, some, some very good performance empirically has been achieved by doing approximate um, posterior marginalization in conjunction with these types of priors, which is evidence in itself that you know, something good is, is probably happening. But um, there was a paper that you might be aware of about um, cold posteriors. So, um, I think the paper was something like uh, how good is the posterior really or something like that. Or, um, and um, they noticed that a lot of works that were um, you know, doing Bayesian marginalization tended to raise the likelihood to a certain power. So we have W given D is, P, is proportional to P of D given W times PW. So in many cases, we were raising the likelihood to some power, one over T, and making T T less than one. And so that's why they were called cold posteriors. And um, the paper um, argues, I, would, I wouldn't say argues, but claims fairly forcefully that this is a, a non-Bayesian thing to do. It sort of sharply deviates from the Bayesian paradigm and indicates that something is kind of really going wrong with uh, some aspect of the Bayesian modeling procedure. And they mostly kind of point, I think, to the prior as probably the issue. Um, and they have an experiment um, where they show that if you use a prior, if you use PW equals N0I, and then you sample from that prior different parameters and form your F of X, let's say WJ for a given sample WJ, then if we look at a problem like CIFAR 10, that function will tend to assign almost all of the data just to one of the classes. And then if we resample W from that prior and then um, get our new neural network function and apply it to CIFAR 10, it'll assign all the data to a somewhat different class. And this was presented as kind of this dramatic result that there's something obviously horribly wrong with this arbitrary N0i prior. Um, now, um, we can think about this a little bit more critically and try to understand <laughs> why we might be getting that, that result. So um, the last layer of a convolutional neural network involves a softmax transformation. And 
if the signal variance of our distribution over the parameters is misspecified, like it's too large, for instance, then that softmax will quickly saturate and basically just assign all the data to one class. And so we showed in this, this paper, the Bayesian Deep Learning and a Probabilistic Perspective of Generalization, that if you just tune alpha or even just use whatever we would use for standard L2 regularization, then this effect completely disappears. Like instead of using N0 I, use N0 alpha squared I and just specify alpha to like something reasonable. And it can be honestly quite a wide range of different alphas. And you'll get um, you know, the, the result that prior samples are basically high entropy, uh, look almost uniform over the different class labels if we're applying the function to all the different data points in say CPAR 10. Um, so that was kind of very easy to fix. Um, and was like, yeah, it's misspecification, but it's sort of trivial to fix. And it's also a question of whether that misspecification even really matters. So let's suppose we didn't tune alpha and we use the bad alpha. It turns out that even though if we've observed no data, we have this effect, it only takes about a hundred data points for the posterior to quickly adapt and learn more the right scale for the data and provide again, kind of a uniform distribution over um, all the different you know, points in CIFAR 10 in terms of classification. Um, and so this could be sort of akin to a Gaussian process where you just multiply the kernel by some random sort of like large value. And you'll see that the amplitude is quite affected in the prior. But if you then observe a bunch of data that's all really constrained, the posterior will quickly crunch in that region. Um, and so this isn't a very serious type of misspecification. What would be a more serious kind of misspecification would be if we didn't have a reasonable, say, induced covariance function for this distribution over functions. So in this paper, we looked at like, how does the prior, if we just over functions, if we just use this N0 alpha squared I prior over parameters, perceive the similarities between different images, for instance. Um, and so if we look at things like MNIST, we can see that, that this prior over functions is saying that visually similar looking images are actually more correlated a priori than dissimilar images. And there is this property like translation equivariance and so on that, that holds through in the prior. There's also a lot of other interesting results that suggest that this prior is quite reasonable beyond you know, good empirical performance. So there was a paper called the deep image prior, which showed that if you just randomly sampled parameters from a Gaussian distribution with a neural net, you could solve all sorts of interesting image interpolation in painting uh, super resolution tasks um, without any training at all. Um, and there was another result in a paper about rethinking generalization. Um, uh, uh, so it basically showed that, um, you know, you, ConfNet could fit data with random labels and this was presented as an issue or whatever, but part of their paper involved um, seeing what happens if you pre-process data with a randomly initialized neural net. And it turns out you can improve the performance of other methods by quite a substantial margin on things like CFR10, say bringing them from 50% accuracy to about 75% accuracy just by having them act on the outputs, uh, the features of, of uh, a randomly initialized convolutional neural net. Um, so this is another, I think, strong result that suggests that um, you know, these priors are actually in many ways quite reasonable. Um, another uh, result is um, we can compute the approximate marginal likelihood um, under those priors for things like structured image data sets versus noisy image data sets. And this can also resolve this issue that was presented in this paper about rethinking generalization and show that even though the Bayesian neural net is able to perfectly fit these noisy data sets, it doesn't really want to. Those types of data sets don't have very high marginal likelihood. And so this is kind of the difference between flexibility and inductive biases. I think we want flexibility. We want our models to represent a wide array of solutions to a given problem as long as we believe that those solutions are possible. Um, but we also want to have a reasonable distribution of that support. We want certain solutions to be more a priori likely than others. And under this standard prior, that is the case. Um, uh, uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the sort of structured images are, are favored by these models. And there's another result that if we use this sort of multi-swag um, approach to marginalization, you can entirely alleviate this double descent behavior. Um, that you get where there's sort of the classical regime and then this interpolation regime. Instead, performance improves monotonically with increases in flexibility. And um, this would be a consequence, I think, of the standard sort of Bayesian philosophy for model construction, as long as you were doing fairly exhaustive marginalization in conjunction with a reasonable prior. It's sort of this notion that 
our performance should monotonically improve with increases in flexibility because we're just representing our honest beliefs and using a flexible model as long as we also have a reasonable induced distribution over functions. Um, so all of these results are strongly in favor of um, these standard priors. So what about the cold posteriors? Is this problematic? Well, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, there are many reasons we might want to do tempering. I mean, first of all, there is, I think, a valid question about whether tempering is even necessary on these problems. Um, and this is something, you know, like uh, you'll, you'll hear more about that shortly. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, assuming that we, we do actually do tempering and it helps, uh, you know, that we can wonder whether this is, says something troubling about, say, a Bayesian procedure. Um, and I think that what they claim is that if you, if you raise the power one over t with t less than one, then you're kind of overcounting the data and that's kind of a non-Bayesian thing to do. Um, so I guess a few quick thoughts on that. Um, the first is um, related to the observation about deep ensembles, that what is optimal to do in some asymptotic limit is often different than what is optimal to do under computational constraints. Um, and so, for instance, if we try, even assuming that the prior and likelihood are perfectly specified, then we could still, in some cases, benefit from tempering. Like, let's suppose we have samples from an N0i distribution, and it's a really high dimensional distribution, and we want to estimate its mean. The norms of these samples are going to be very close to root D. And so by doing tempering, by using sort of like a, a low temperature, we'll be able to come up with a much better estimate of the mean than we would otherwise if we weren't doing tempering. And so this is a case of how tempering can actually help um, if we're just sort of constrained in our computational efforts. Um, another observation is um, that we actually do believe that the posterior is misspecified. And I would say at a high level, um, we, in, when we're following a Bayesian approach, we want to represent our honest beliefs. And of course, the best way to do that is to try to specify your prior and likelihood as honestly as possible. But even after we've made our best efforts to do that, we should recognize that this is not going to be a perfectly specified model. And we should try to accommodate for that in any reasonable way. And I think tempering is one kind of reasonable way to, to try to do that. So it would be absolutely no shock, even if you had a reasonably well-specified model, for t equals one to not be the absolutely optimal setting of that hyperparameter. Um, I think, you know, assuming it's not too inconvenient, we should always probably do tempering. And I would say that that is compatible, at least at a high level, with the Bayesian paradigm. Um, another observation is um, that, um, you know, in terms of overcounting data and whether something is Bayesian and so on, um, Empirical Bayes is a pretty sort of standard procedure that we often use and actually was really embraced by the pioneers of Bayesian neural nets like David Mackay. Um, there are some sort of beautiful sort of descriptions of how uh, the Bayesian evidence will automatically embody Occam's razor, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, I, I would say that, you know, this is also an issue with empirical Bayes that you are overcounting the data. like. The, the, the data that you sort of use in your prior, you're sort of using the same data in your likelihood in your prior to some extent. And this is in, in some ways a bit problematic, but it's not viewed as like some sharp divergence from the Bayesian paradigm. In fact, it's often understood through Bayesian principles. And so this wouldn't be a point about how tempering is Bayesian, but it's more how, um, you know, it's akin to procedures like empirical Bayes, which still are often naturally understood from a Bayesian perspective. Um, so those are a few thoughts on tempering. Um, another thought is, well, are we even doing a good job at approximate inference? Um, so uh, in this called posteriors paper, it was somewhat assumed that they're getting this sort of gold standard of posterior samples. Um, you know, it, 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 it's unclear if those results will hold, um, hint, hint, if, um, you know, you, you actually do a better job of posterior inference and um, you uh, run multiple chains and do other things to try to ensure that you're getting good coverage of the actual posterior. Um, I guess one final observation on tempering is like, if we think about something like a Gaussian process regression, where we have maybe a Gaussian likelihood and we raise the, the likelihood to some power, like one over T, well, what effect does that have? It will basically be scaling our noise by some parameter. It'll scale the normalization concept, but that won't really affect our predictions. Um, and so um, learning the temperature is actually in many ways very similar to learning the noise of our likelihood when we're doing Gaussian process regression. And that's something that we, we know would always want to do. Um, uh, in a sense, you know, uh, 
learning the temperature is basically trying to learn some aspect of your likelihood. And I think that's also completely compatible with the Bayesian paradigm. Uh, so uh, I guess those are my, my thoughts on, on tempering and at a high level on Bayesian deep learning. I mean, there's a question of um, where we might go next, because obviously, while this prior might have some nice properties, it's not going to be the best prior. There are things we can do to improve it. Um, uh, and I think a lot of effort has been spent on trying to make these priors in function space more like Gaussian processes. And while that's kind of interesting, I think it's also perhaps a double-edged sword. Um, Gaussian processes are these beautiful models that are often relatively interpretable, but we already have Gaussian processes. So if we're trying to create a distribution over parameters that induces a distribution over functions that is like a GP with a standard kernel, then are we not just creating you know, somewhat crappy approximations to GPs? Um, why not just use a, a Gaussian process? I mean, neural nets are, are interesting as a model class in their own right, precisely because they're different from other model classes. They have different inductive biases that help them perform better in certain applications, especially in modeling high dimensional natural signals. And so in moving away from this N0 alpha squared I prior, we have to be careful that we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. All right, so that's that's the end of my talk. Okay, that was great. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if there are some additional questions. Um, yeah, you can ra either raise your hand or just uh, unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. Perhaps I can start with one. Yeah. Oh, there is one. Uh, go ahead. Perhaps I misheard something. Um, right, I was wondering whether uh, with increasing amount of data, would the ensembles find the same mode? or you would expect them to still kind of maintain the diversity of modes that they find? Right, that's an interesting question. So how quickly does the posterior contract, for instance? Um, I would say that for all practical purposes, um, deep ensembles will tend to find quite a variety of solutions that neural nets tend to be very, very underspecified by the amount of available data. Uh, and um, this is actually part of the reason I think we really want to do Bayesian inference in this setting. Um, like there's a lot of uncertainty to integrate over when we're using a neural net with tens of millions of parameters and just tens of thousands of data points. Um, and uh, you know, that's why we should, I think, especially care about developing interesting Bayesian procedures in this context. Um, so. I guess the short answer to this is like you would see some contraction and I think in principle is if you if you had loads and loads and loads of data, the value of deep ensembling would would diminish and eventually your posterior should look like, you know, kind of convex or it should sort of converge to a bunch of different point masses that are just representing symmetric solutions to the problem. Um, uh, but in practice, we don't really observe this. Uh, so I've never seen this, you know, happen to any significant extent on any kind of real problems. Okay. Thanks. Well, that's a good question. Have any of you tried using Bayesian neural nets? How did it go? Uh, yeah, so uh, the startup I worked at before here, we primarily used Bayes by backprop. So I was quite amused that you brought mm -hmm. that up because very few people mention it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, the main problem, of course, with that is, is scalability and, and uh, issues. But uh, yeah, it's a fun thing to play around with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been a real evolution, I think, in you know methodological design for Bayesian neural nets. I think you know, although Bayesian neural nets, at some some sense, are, are old, there hasn't really been much work on them until um, I mean, there's a bit of work in the early '90s, and that kind of froze until about 2016. Um, and in the early years of Bayesian deep learning, say 2016 to 2018, um, I would say practical performance was not really a focus. 
Uh, it was more just exploring a bunch of ideas that were sometimes conceptually interesting, but the results were actually even, I might argue in many cases, kind of embarrassing compared to uh, just classical training. Like it's like we have this big complicated machine and it's giving us something that's like a bit worse than SGD. Like why would anyone, you know, use this because it's principled or something like, I don't think anyone is going to be like, you know, convinced by that. Um, but I think something has really shifted where now in the last two years, you're seeing papers that are providing methods that, don't cost additional computation compared to standard training, but are providing really convincingly better results, both in terms of calibration and, you know, uncertainty representation, but also in terms of, um, you know, just accuracy of point predictions. Often you can get sort of a non-trivial relative gain in, in accuracy by trying to do a Bayesian model average efficiently. Um, and so this has really changed. And I, I, I get the sense that the people writing papers about Bayesian deep learning now do really care about the performance. So, you know, there is often a focus on like um, efficient computations on uh, achieving good results on even standard deep learning benchmarks, which I think is a good thing. Those aren't the only problems that are interesting, but I think, you know, it is meaningful to try to do well on CIFAR 10 and ImageNet because we have an understanding of how classical approaches um, behave on those problems. And some of them are still, you know, kind of challenging. Do you know if anyone has, has managed to build a Bayesian transformer yet? I don't think, I don't think that's happened, but maybe, <laughs> maybe you guys could do it. <laughs> <laughs> you just make you're just making me think what priors I would use on that. That's a bit more tricky. But. Yeah. There hasn't been a lot of work, interestingly, on um, kind of, Bayesian generative models. I was expecting that to happen more than it has. Uh, so kind of early on in, in the, the, the sort of wave of Bayesian deep learning, I, I wrote a paper with Eunice, uh, actually a lab mate at, at Cambridge, um, who, uh, which was talking about Bayesian GANs. Um, and the idea is, you know, how would we try to do posterior inference over parameters in a GAN? And why would we want to do that? It's sort of this idea that now, instead of just a single generator, we have a distribution over generators. And um, maybe we could leverage that for some problem like semi-supervised learning, where we want a better representation of the, the distribution of images that we're modeling. And it helped a bit. And I thought it was kind of conceptually interesting. Um, but uh, uh, there, there really hasn't been much work in this space. And I don't, I don't know why. I mean, not just in regards to Bayesian GAN specifically, but just Bayesian generative models. Why are we not using Bayesian VAEs or Bayesian normalizing flows or other things like this? Um, and uh, I don't really have a good answer. Um, I mean, if I were to speculate, uh, it could be that maybe we just wanted to focus on the easier problems first, like just vanilla supervised learning. And uh, the, you know, there's been a lot of progress there. So maybe we'll see a bit of a shift towards unsupervised modeling. It could also be because generative models are often hard to evaluate. Um, like people often evaluate them just by looking at like the fidelity of samples. Um, like do, the, do these images look nice? And um, that's not something that a Bayesian method is going to help you do very well, I think, because um, it's just sampling from some posterior over generators. But if you wanted a high fidelity image, maybe even just taking the mode might be the right thing to do. If you wanted sort of uh, uh, some representation of uncertainty that could help you in a downstream task like um, semi-supervised learning, then maybe I think it would be useful. But uh, it turns out that generative models actually aren't nearly as good at semi-supervised learning, at least so far, as just some simple heuristics that are often used in deep learning, like consistency and regularization. And so, I don't know, maybe that's why, but you know, maybe in the end it will help with some of these puzzles. Like people have noticed that normalizing flows and other generative models seem to fail quite badly out of distribution detection. And uh, you know, there are various questions there that are relevant, like the difference between typical points and high density points and so on. And uh, maybe we'll start to, to see some application of Bayesian methods again in these, these settings, but it's not something that has happened as much as I would have expected. Okay, I think uh, this one hour that we set out for the seminar is out. Um, so uh, anyone who wants to stick around, please do. Uh, and we can continue some discussions, but uh, otherwise uh, seminar is uh, officially over. Thank you.